my name is Alex Kiffer and I'm a history research graduate at St. Anne's College, Oxford. Uh, I'm going to use my time today to present very much the broad strokes of my current research project, which, as my title suggests, aims to understand the multiplicity of considerations taken in the process of restitution of works of art at the end of the Napoleonic period. Uh, largely, this subject has been approached from a diplomatic perspective, which positions it within the wider discourses on the Congress of Vienna and the Concert of Europe. However, I hope that through this paper, I'll illustrate why it is important to understand this period of restitution beyond the limits of pure legality, and instead to engage in the behaviours and motivations of secondary actors uh, throughout this process. Now, uh, following Napoleon's final defeat and exile after Waterloo, some 1.2 million Allied soldiers fell upon France. Uh, as you can see here, they represented a diversity of international diplomatic, military and cultural interests which were not always uh, in unity. However, it was not until November of 1815 that the Second Treaty of Paris was signed, which, among numerous other things, regularized the legal procedure of occupation and the consequent post-war reparations. Uh, however, its predecessor, which was signed in May 1814, uh, was the first uh, definitive Treaty of Paris. Uh, now, it had largely failed to address numerous legal issues that had arisen by the time of occupation, which Wellington uh, famously called the silences of the Treaty of Paris. Um, also, on the 3rd of July, uh, the Convention of saint Cloud was signed, which formally began the occupation process and aimed to restate the terms of 1814, but within a post-Waterloo setting. Um, so, this was when France was occupied. However, there was a period without any regulatory form of international law underpinning it uh, between these months. Uh, now, in these brief few months, uh, it set the stage for an incredibly chaotic post-war occupation, which brought to the fore many unforeseen difficulties in the transfer of cultural property uh, between various states. Now, within this period of time, my research specifically challenges the legal recourse for the restitution of cultural property, which was held in the Poland collections, both in the Louvre, but also across France and to which Allied diplomats, officers and commissioners held claims to. Uh, there was then, as there are now, two central approaches taken to post-war restitution. Uh, the first being that art must always be returned to its place of origin no matter what, and the other being to the victor go the spoils. This is, however, quite a reductive dichotomy which undermines the incredible nuances of uh, legal, moral, economic and philosophical arguments that are instrumental in understanding this process of historical restitution. Now, in this paper, I hope to clearly illustrate the limitations of legal treaties in the case of post-Napoleonic restitutions, uh, using the restitution of Flemish art as a case study for this, before then exploring the alternative influences in the absence of legal certainty. Uh, within the Napoleonic restitutions that occurred before the signing of the Second Treaty of Paris, there were, I believe, three dominant influences that ultimately decided the fate of Napoleonic plunder after Waterloo. First was the role of the Prussian government, who sought to enact a form of military vengeance. Uh, and this very much was uh, dominated by ideas of uh, national prestige in the face of humiliation after the Napoleonic Wars. Secondly, I believe that between all parties, there were practical, economic and logistical considerations, which played an enormous role in deciding the outcome of these disputes. Finally, it is the role of the British and the Papal States, who, in the absence of legal superiority, uh, appeal to moral and aesthetic arguments in favour of the restitution of art, however, with some hypocrisy, as we shall see. Collectively, what my research into these prevailing considerations between secondary acts and the restitution process hopes to reveal is that the very idea of a legal restitution didn't even really exist until November 20th, and arguably, even after that, the parameters of what counts as legal recourse around the subject were incredibly vague. However, firstly, it's important to stress the limitations of legality in this context. Nowhere else is this more apparent than in the inconsistencies of the Flemish case. Um, although Dutch commissioners were sent to Paris to oversee the restitutions, the process was largely instigated by Wellington and the British. The Flemish restitutions immediately raised alarm with the French authorities who claimed, and I quote, these objects had nothing in common with the current war since these paintings had been acquired by France in a time when Bonaparte was for nothing in the French government. 
Furthermore, many in the, in the administration believe that these demands undermined the Convention of saint cloud which stated that the Allies could not take property that was not directly related to war, and they didn't perceive the Flemish art as being related directly to the Napoleonic Wars, as it was taken by the revolutionary armies. Uh, Talion even went so far as to claim that the entire convention was illegitimate, as it had been signed before Louis XVIII had returned to Paris. However, despite the strength of the French case, legally speaking, uh, as this letter, letter to Castlereagh shows, Wellington was simply not willing to let petty squabbles over the fine print of a year-old treaty detract from what was an opportunity to teach France a great moral lesson. Uh, just to further illustrate the chaos of the Flemish restitutions without being regularized by any form of consistent legal codification is the case of two paintings by Rubens. One, the descent from the cross, which the Dutch immediately claimed. It was, in fact, the first item listed as being taken in the official report composed by the French administration, uh, and the other, which is the triumph of Judas Maccabeus, uh, which went completely forgotten. Um, it was actually taken from Paris uh, to Nantes in 1801, uh, and it remained there when the uh, Allies arrived in Paris, and it remains there to this day. Uh, now, what is particularly interesting is that the administration in Paris actually anticipated the Dutch to make claims for the painting, yet they never did. Uh, the neglect of any Flemish works beyond Paris suggested a certain opportunism on the part of the Allies, which draws into question the consistency of their procedure. Uh, furthermore, when paintings weren't being forgotten, they were simply going missing. Uh, now, here is the case of uh, the Ten Years, uh, uh, which was titled The Dance of the Sound of the Bagpipes in the Catalogue, um, and that could actually be a number of uh, different paintings. Um, now, uh, it was reported missing by Lavallee, the secretary of uh, the Louvre, on October 26, 1815. Uh, and immediately, they accused the Dutch of taking it. Uh, the Dutch denied it, and it was left at that. However, uh, it only turned up again on the doorstep of the Louvre on June 1st, 1816, wrapped in brown paper and accompanied with a note. Uh, this note read as follows. The painting was taken away by a Frenchman in the hopes that it would not fall prey to the Allies. The praiseworthy intentions of this person should protect him from any misunderstandings that could be made, but he wishes to keep his identity anonymous. He hopes to see the exhibition of this painting at the next Salon. And uh, indeed he did, uh, as it was shown in 1817 in the Louvre. Uh, the very fact that a Parisian citizen could just walk in amid soldiers and curators and take this painting is fairly indicative of the administrative chaos that we're dealing with here, and the figures at the time were completely aware of that. So, in lieu of legal certainty, other considerations emerged which equally saw commissioners and soldiers execute their orders with varying behaviours. In the Prussian case, the tactic chosen was absolute brutality. Whereas the Dutch were happy to miss off a few paintings here and there, the Prussians and other German states were determined to get everything back that was theirs. This sentiment was largely reflected by uh, popular opinion and the press, uh, as can be seen here there was generally the belief that this was their inalienable national property and therefore regardless of any uh, legal treaties it had to be returned. Um, now uh, this Prussian rapaciousness was reflected not only in public opinion but also in the behavior of certain individual commissioners and officers sent by Prussia. In total between May 1814 and November 1815 seven different commissioners were sent to Paris whereas most states only had sent one. Um, but they all consistently acted with notable malice. Such is the case of one Commissioner Schutz, who was subject of numerous complaints in 1815. The first was for starting a fight with a carpenter. Uh, five days later, a complaint was submitted about his use of uh, abusive and inappropriate language. And four, four days later, a formal complaint had to be submitted to the Ministry of the Interior, who in turn were asked to liaise with the Prussian state to do something about Schutz. Now, this wasn't purely uh, a grievance that the administration had with the conduct of Schutz in particular, but rather that Prussian bullishness made the restitution process unnecessarily complicated. Uh, they came unaware of what their predecessors had already claimed before them and were often inclined to try and take things that weren't strictly theirs. Now, there are many, uh, many instances of this in the archives. However, uh, here is just one snippet which details a demand directly made by Blucher for certain portraits of the Bonaparte family, um, which had absolutely nothing to do with Prussia or with the restitution process at all. Uh, furthermore, there are reports from saint cloud of collections of paintings belonging, uh, being painted you know, in France, belonging to France, having to do with Prussia, which were demanded by the Prussians, 
and which uh, officers didn't know how to remove the canvas from the frames. So they ended up using bayonets and many of those paintings uh, are simply missing, presumed destroyed. Now, of course, despite the ambitions of individual states, the actual logistical process of restitution came at a considerable cost. And thus these practical economic considerations became an inevitable guiding force in negotiations. For the French administration alone, these costs included the basic monthly administrative costs, as well as the additional funds to restore damaged artifacts, as well as requesting emergency funds, which had to be taken from other parts of the annual budget. Uh, the material costs from the Napoleonic Wars had otherwise decimated the national budget, and so the museum's administration remained very aware uh, of the nature of these costs. Now, these economic and logistical considerations resulted in certain negotiations, such as that of the wedding of Kana, which a French administrators suggested be swapped for a Le Brun due to the enormous size of the Veronese painting. Uh, the Viennese commissioner, uh, Salvatore Rosa, agreed to this exchange. Uh, however, the correspondence between French administrations suggests they may have had an ulterior motive beyond simple logistics in suggesting this uh, negotiation. Now, as we can see from this uh, extract here, the wedding at Karna was estimated by the, uh, the French at the value of more than 1 million francs, whereas the Le Brun was only 30,000 francs. And the fact that the administration made note of this is rather telling in and of itself that the idea of culture as capital and having a real market value um, heavily influenced how negotiations were practiced both by the Allies but also by the French. So finally, it is important to consider how moral or philosophical ideas influence certain negotiations in the absence of legality. When discussing aestheticism in 1815, it's very important to address the writings of Katakame de Kansi, who was a highly influential voice at the time. In 1815, he published his Moral Considerations, which indirectly uh, commented on the subject of museums and the mass migration of art. In particular, he stressed here the importance of the social function of art to its place of origin, and largely as a figure, he uh, uh, signed petitions against the removal of particular items from Rome and Italy um, back to the Louvre. Now, the influence of Katakame can be quite clearly traced. He was a close friend of Canova, and the correspondence between the two men show that they shared the same views on the philosophy and ethics of art. Canova then was sent to Paris in 1815 as papal envoy and was in constant communication both with Salvatore Rosa, the uh, Viennese envoy, but also with William Hamilton, who was a British antiquarian in Paris assisting negotiations as Castlereagh's undersecretary. Uh, Canova and Hamilton were very close, as is evident in their own correspondence, and Katakame's ideas passed through Canova to Hamilton, who in turn was instrumental in advising Castlereagh on how the British should proceed in Paris. However, it's also important to note that prior to his time in Paris, Hamilton worked alongside Elgin in extracting the Parthenon marbles and transporting them to London. Now, the line of influence actually goes both ways, as by extension of Hamilton's relation to Elgin, Canova felt compelled to write his gratitude to Elgin for taking the marbles from Athens after he saw them first in London. Uh, funnily enough, immediately following uh, his time in Paris, Canova took a short trip to London with the intention of having Katzkomer's moral considerations, the original aesthetic text, uh, translated into English, and it was there that he saw uh, the Parthenon marbles. However, these moral arguments, which were used strongly by British and papal commissioners to bolster their demands for restitution in lieu of any legal precedent, were somewhat hypocritical, to say the least, uh, as the Elgin connection illustrates. This hypocrisy was not lost on Denon, who was the Director General for Museums under Napoleon and largely responsible for negotiating restitutions during this period. Uh, here we can see uh, in a heated debate with Hamilton that he argues the following. Uh, Let us set aside for a moment the glorious means to which we owe the formation of the French Museum, as well as the treaties that seem to guarantee its duration. And let us instead see how your British Museum was formed, that your mad pride already dares to compare it to that of France. Does it not owe its existence to the degradation of the monuments of Athens, degradations protected in the person of a public man and sanctioned by a national acquisition? And you dare to question these principles whilst you have only the will and strength to object to the most sacred treaties. You speak of what is foreign to your interests, and yet you are not ashamed to come to my house to know if in my furious indignation I will not provide some means to your torturous project. Now, I would just like to leave you on a few, uh, I would like to just leave you with a few concluding thoughts. Uh, despite much of the literature surrounding this period placing a great emphasis on legality and diplomacy through the lens of the Congress of Vienna, the reality is that in regards to the restitution and protection of cultural property, there simply was no coherent form of international law. 
As such, any discussions on these cases which appeal to legal recourse is simply misguided. Instead, I think it's most constructive to consider these economic, military, and practical and philosophical arguments and try to develop some frame of thinking that allows contemporary historians and legal scholars to be able to unpick the nature of these disputes within their own unique context. I think that as tempting as it is to denounce Napoleonic cultural imperialism without further thought, there are certain nuances and complexities to the acquisition and restitution of cultural property which really need to be understood before any accusations for or indeed against certain restitutions can be made. Uh, I would just like to leave you now on a few lines from a poem which I thought to be particularly relevant, which was composed by Shelley on the advent of the fall of Bonaparte and the consequent actions of the Allies. Shelley was an ardent Republican and denounced Bonaparte throughout his reign. However, when faced with the international situation that arose following Napoleon's exile to St. Helena, he made the following acknowledgement. I know too late, since thou and France are in the dust, that virtue owns a more eternal foe than force or fraud. Old custom, legal crime, and bloody faith. The foulest birth of time. Thank you.